I'm Dave Price, and welcome to the American Farmland Owner Podcast, where farmland owners get their news. This week's guest is Dr. Scott Brown. He's an Associate Extension Professor in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources at the University of Missouri-Columbia. He's been there since 1989, and he's an expert in livestock market outlook and dairy policy. He's testified before Congress, and he also assists Missouri lawmakers when it comes to farm policy. He's a farm boy himself. He grew up on a farm in Northwest Missouri with row crops, sows, and a few cattle. But like many others, his family left the farm during the farm crisis of the 1980s. He's dedicated the past several decades advising, researching, and teaching. We start our conversation about what he's watching in agriculture right now. All right, let's start out with this. You've you've spent most of your life in this field, right? What is it about this? Well, I, I I think when you look at where we are today, we know we're very likely headed to what's I'll say is a tougher financial time for farmers across the country. The hard part is just knowing how difficult it becomes or what's what changes what are the risks that maybe make it better or make it worse uh the, the volatility that we face today i think is the hardest piece of this puzzle for farmers to navigate in what is a situation where many of them have such large capital outlays today that perfect decisions today become perhaps disastrous outcomes just a few months down the road so perspective is important with this right there were two just bountiful years in there and now this is the reset which you know the reset can be pretty painful in a lot of ways how how do you see this reset plan out well I th- so i think you're correct in that you know you look back at at 2021 2022 2023 all all really reasonably good years better than we would have thought uh, with COVID being uh, happening in, in 2020. So we're coming off of really, really good times. It's not surprising that we're seeing this downward trajectory. I, I, I guess as I look ahead, number one, I'll say producers in many parts of the country are in very sound financial position today. Equity positions that probably haven't been seen for a long time, high market prices, government payments associated with COVID, I think helped generate a a stronger equity position. I think that equity position goes away um, or at least is reduced as as we look ahead. So maybe it's not uh, as as painful as we've seen historically, but it certainly changes the financial picture uh, for producers. And it's more of an incremental step down because of that that period where folks were flush with cash because of the government support? Yeah, so I think many of them are still in really good position. It's just now we're going to talk about kind of that leakage, if you will, of equity back out of the operation. It's not, hey, we're not going to come to the harvest this fall and say, we've got serious problems. We have problems that similar to what we would have had, let's say, in the 1980s. We're just talking about a slow leak down, I think, of equity, unless something catastrophic happens as as we go through 2024. I think the question really is, is how long does that leakage happen? Is this two years, three years, five years? And I think the answer to that question matters a lot to, to farmers as they're trying to do long run planning. You have longer term perspective on this. And I'm wondering when you were looking at some of these final figures from last year, were you amazed at how well producers were able to produce despite this three, almost four years long drought that a lot of them have dealt with? It It is amazing what's happened over the last several years in terms of the resilience to what's been dry weather. I, I think, you set this up very well in that we've been in drought conditions for multiple years, below trend yields for multiple years when you look back at, at the situation. 
yet we're a far cry from where we were when we saw the 2012 drought. Technology's played a big role in what's happened. Seed technology is certainly different today. Um, I don't know how many producers I talked to uh, this fall and winter who would say, you know, one end of my field was 20 bushel corn and the other end of the field was 200. Hmm. So I, I think one of the differences is just how much it yields changed as you moved over small geographic parts of, of a particular area. That, that added volatility. Um, unlike in the past where it seems like everybody was in a drought in an area or no one was this, uh, depending on when I planted, what kind of rain I got at particular times that that's changed the dynamics. But at the end of the day, I think all producers almost across the country had yields that would have beat their expectations come uh, last summer. This is a tough one to say, but is that, is that kind of part of the problem? Our, our folks are just so good and we do not have the market for all of this? I think we're certainly looking at a situation where maybe more for corn than things like soybeans, mm -hmm. where corn supplies are happening at a rate greater than utilization. It it all of a sudden makes us depend even more on export markets when domestic use hasn't really been growing. I, I think you hit the nail on the head here with, I'll say all the time, the supply side of these industries have become very unresponsive to price. We plant that acre every year. Only weather dictates whether we have uh, what kind of crop we put in the bin at the end of the year. And, and I'll say, I think demand for these commodities has become less responsive to price. And I talk about that often because that just adds to the volatility. A little shift in supply gets us to move either up that demand curve to very high prices or down that demand curve to very low prices. And, and there's no in, in between. So it's the volatility that I think we see that's more than just answered by black swan events. That, that I think makes this a much tougher world for producers today. Part of this Ag Economist Monthly Monitor, where you talk to a lot of smart folks across the country trying to figure things out, what's the what's the lay of the land? What are people thinking? Well, I, th I think on average, you know, if you look at the overall barometer, we kind of ask people will con people are continuing to answer not as good as where we were last year. Um, they don't say catastrophic, we're in deep trouble. It's just been a kind of a constant response of not as good as where we've been. N expectation for the next year, not quite as good as where we sit today. Uh, how, however, I will say when I look at some of the individual responses, we have economists all over the board. Um, I, I think back to some of the old days and it seemed like a lot of us would have been on the same page but, but now it's just harder with the volatility. And, and so the range of responses is, is a lot greater than maybe I would have expected uh, when we first started the survey. One thing I was thinking about when I was looking at those figures was maybe the difference in mindset that we, we have been waiting, 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 waiting for the Fed to push down these rates, right? And so it was, when's that gonna happen? Well, then, then it seemed like we kind of had this informal consensus that, all right, let's get to June and then we're gonna start to see some backing off, right? And your index is now showing a little more pessimism with what people are expecting and kind of big picture, yeah, maybe they get bumped down a little bit, but it's not gonna be a heck of a lot in 2024. And I'm curious, what's, in your mind, what's factoring into this? Why are people starting to pull back expectations a little bit? Yeah, I think when you when we were asking these questions back in November, December, you would have seen a lot of of our respondents answering a full percentage cut in interest rates, and it happening earlier in in 2024. We generally become more pessimistic and suggest maybe more like a half a point cut uh, as we go through 2024. Which is interesting because when you look at the overall barometer, it was more positive towards the end of 2023. And I think that was related to this expectation of more interest rate cuts. Um, I think when we look at 
where we've been, number one, demand stayed stronger. The economy stayed stronger. Inflation may be still continuing to, to rear its head a little bit, which just suggests the Fed's approach to trying to get inflation in, in more check uh, would suggest just less of a short-term potential for an increase in interest rates. So I, I, I think that's been one of the biggest uncertainties as we've gone through the first uh, few months of 2024. But as you look at it, are most folks actually, I mean, obviously, I don't want to be flipping about this, obviously, if you know, if you owe money and you or you want to, uh, you need to borrow money, you want this as low as possible. But looking at perspective here, and to your point about how people were doing during COVID, are they actually positioned okay if these rates just trickle down rather than getting that one point cut or whatever folks were originally hoping for? Yeah, so I, I think this idea of interest rate cuts has a lot to do with operating interest that's going to have to be paid back, not land cost or land interest payments. When I look at some data related to what percentage of the ag land has a loan against it these days, it, it, it just reminds me of the good financial position many of our producers are in today. Um, I see some counties who would have 20% or less of that ag land that actually has a, a, a loan against it. And, and so I, I view interest rate cuts have a lot more to do with what's it cost me to get that crop uh, planted, harvested. It's, it's the operating side where I think these cuts could be most helpful. It's one of the expenses that's going to, to be the highest when we think about 2024. Do you see now, you know, if you need a new truck and you're not paying cash, you may see an interest rate of 8% or something like that right now. Are you are you feeling that folks are going to push off bigger purchases like that? Is that how they kind of get through 2024 or where do you see the adjustments happening? So I do see that slow down. So let's let's look at land values. So we've continued to see land values move higher. Of, of late, it seems like we're, we're seeing a little bit of the shine come off of higher land values. So I think people are being a little more cautious in those decisions. Uh, uh, to your point about machinery complement in general, I think the machinery complement that's sitting across the, the, the U.S. here is about as new as we've seen in quite a while. So the opportunity to stretch that current machinery complement out further, I, I think just helps reduce the risk. Um, and so it's when we get beyond, so we can't stretch out anymore. All of a sudden we need to replace that truck or we need to replace that tractor. Um, we, we may find ourselves if interest rates stay high, uh, in a very different situation. Can you, can you talk a little bit about cattle and hogs? So we, we've seen cattle overall is the lowest in what, 60 years, something like that. Do you see the hog industry following anything from what we've seen in the cattle industry? Will there be that big pullback because of prices or is it two completely different worlds? Yeah, so I guess I view it a little differently. I'll say, you know, number one, I think when we look at the cattle industry, dry weather matters. Uh, and, and perhaps this is a situation where, where we've had technology that helps us in yields of, of especially corn, I'll say, we don't have the same technology on the grass side of the equation. And, and when you realize that, you know, we've been in long-term drought in cattle country, we really crossed over in mid 2020 of, I say crossover, that long run average percentage of, of uh, land that, that was in a drought designation. It took us until early 2024 to be back below that long run average. Mm -hmm. When we think about just cattle country generally, so multi-year drought mattered. Uh, we would not be at the lowest uh, cow inventory in 60 years without what's been terrible drought conditions in many, part of in many parts of cattle country. Hogs gets a buffer from this, right? So we're, we're all confinement, uh, at least 99% confinement. Um, and in fact, I say for hog producers, especially those that have invested in expensive facilities, there is no choice but to operate at 100% capacity. Um, and 
only if my lender comes to me and says, it's time for us to, to take those assets over, do I quit? And the bank then takes those assets and what do they do? They re they find someone else willing to, to perhaps loan to on cents on the dollar. Um, and those facilities keep producing hogs. So the supply side gets very sticky. The old hog cycle of two years up, two years down, at, at best we go sideways or flat in terms of production. And because, I, I see sorry that to continuing. interrupt your thought, but is it because the operations are just so much bigger than they once were? Is it as simple as that? I, I think bigger and the investment per sow. Okay. There just is no flexibility. You Once you've made the investment, you have to produce um, because running, uh, not producing in those expensive facilities is a sure way to get out of the business. Okay, sorry to, sorry to interrupt your train of thought. So then, so that's a lot, a lot. To, so what do you forecast for that industry then? Are they going to, is it going to be, you know, they've had a heck of a time here recently. Is it going to get better here in this second half of the year? So I think there's a good potential here. And this is where I'll always say, so we've gotten the supply side at least moving more sideways of late. So production not growing a whole lot. So now what happens as we get into late 2024? I think demand finally catches up and that gives us some higher prices. You know, I'll say demand comes in two forms here. Number one, what's happening per capita Population is the other piece of that puzzle. Population, although slowing in terms of the rate of growth, it is still growing. Um, and, and so eventually, with the flat supply side, we catch up to the demand side, and we can talk about some higher prices. And my argument about becoming more inelastic could suggest we get higher prices pretty quickly coming once we get that balance on the other side. And for the demand, are you seeing it more domestic or is this going to be uh are we going to have to see this this export demand going up I, I saw some headline that younger folks are not in our country are not consuming pork as much they've not been to my table because i think bacon sustained my son for most of his life it was the only meat he ate for probably 10 years and that's that's not really an exaggeration <laughs> but so is it where do you see the demand pushing up or is it both Yes, I was going to answer. I think it is both. Now, I will say I think most of the growth in the next in the coming decade is going to occur outside the United States. Gr growing populations, uh, gr growing economies. Uh, I'll, I'll say I think the, the commodity organizations on the pork side have done a wonderful job at trying to expand to other countries. We don't want to depend on just China uh, in, in terms of, of pork demand. That is good and bad at times. Uh, but this idea that Mexico is a growing market for hams for us is really strong. A number of other Central American countries where, although still small, been growing in leaps and bounds in terms of, of trade. I, I think that's the opportunity now. We can't just look at the export side. So domestic use may look reasonably flat going forward, but Growing domestic demand can be helpful. I say all the time, so bacon is really the easy one, right? So bacon demand has been so good in this country. Um, unless I'm in Iowa, finding a good Iowa, or finding a good pork chop uh, at a restaurant outside of Iowa gets difficult, I think, at times. How do we create this food away from home experience where everybody doesn't answer when I want to have a really good meal, I go get a steak? And they say, I want a pork chop. Um, I, I think there's where the industry can continue to help itself in terms of growing some new demand. Food expenditures away from home, exceeding food expenditures at home since 2015, just reminds me that consumers consume that meat protein differently today. And a big part of this, I'm curious if you'll agree, is as we've finally gotten to the point where wages are outpacing inflation. In theory, American families have more money to spend. We're not flush with cash like we were with all that aid money coming from the Fed, but we are hopefully in a better place now, right? Yeah, so, so demand looks good from that standpoint. When I look at general economic activity, um, 
jobs report we got last week all was positive in in terms of of what that demand side looks like so i think that side has gotten better in the last six or eight months better than i would have anticipated um and, and so i don't see consumers walking away and, and if i'm in the pork business in particular i i may smile a little bit at what's record beef prices hmm. i'm not sure how much substitution away from beef to pork we get but the opportunity to maybe be a cheaper meat protein could certainly be helpful. Um, as you know, I've covered politics most of my professional career, and I know that you've talked to Congress. You work with the Missouri legislature, and which is an easy drive for you from Columbia to Jeff City. As we look more broadly at this, we got to figure out what they're going to do with the farm bill. Uh, we've seen this uh, House, House Republican Study Committee kind of put out this big big picture idea about balancing the budget in seven years, which will, it's hard to fathom that politicians could be that disciplined based on their, based on their track record here. But they're looking at, if, if that would actually happen, they're looking at making some rather substantial cuts in various forms of the ag world. And I'm curious, what, what do you think producers should expect as we go forward? At some point, you would think we're going to have to operate on a federal level differently than what we are. We've got a $35 trillion debt that's climbing so fast here. For producers and folks in this field, how do you, how do you counsel them about what to expect in the years ahead? And I appreciate that's a super broad question, but are there any themes you can warn them about? So I think number one, uh, I, I think when you look even at Congress, the the number of members that understand agriculture in in depth is less than would have been the case 20 years ago. So it makes debating farm policy more, more difficult uh, than maybe we saw in the past. They don't know what happens day to day on these operations. So I think this idea of of can we cut the safety net and and still be okay will continue to be part of the conversation. Um, I, I will say, I don't think we're going to fix our federal debt and deficit problems just by cutting ag spending. Um, and and so we've got a lot of big issues to deal with. So perhaps, uh, although big of one point five trillion, when you take all of the 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 farm bill spending uh, under the current bill that we have, uh, even if we made a zero, it doesn't fix our debt and deficit problems in this country. Um, I, I I think I keep saying the safety net has to adjust over time. Uh, to trying to find this balance of what's a, a good enough safety net to keep folks from running into problems in the very toughest times yet not being too good to have some of the unintended consequences of maybe higher land values and otherwise would be the case. What works today and what might work three years from now may look a little different and, and I think harder to, to chase as we go forward in that the structure is just so different. It uh, doesn't take much to make what's a good safety net. So we'll talk about crop insurance as as being you know the most critical piece you start cutting subsidies to the crop insurance side and all of a sudden it, what's a good safety net becomes not so great um it, it's kind of a, a knife edge if you will about how to create that appropriate safety net so do do any of these elected officials ask you for advice and say hey where should we start with this uh. So, so most of my career has been not so much of good or bad or what should we do, but what, you know, what's your assessment if we make this change, what happens to agriculture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to trying to let the politicians make those political decisions that need to be made. Um, do they ask? So, so sometimes uh, drawn into those conversations, but uh, I, I, I often say, I think it's the role of ag economists in this country to help politicians understand the outcomes of their decisions. If we wanted to, if we wanted to be the ones to write policy, we should run for office.
Sure, but maybe if you were the ones that making the decisions, we'd have a decision. <laughs> <laughs> One way or the other. <laughs> so it's it's been a tough road. It looks so who knows whether we get a farm bill written this year. Yeah. Um I, I think finding the middle ground is getting harder. Um and it may take us a while uh to, to find that next farm bill. I'm really curious to watch how farm policy works the next 10 years, just given where we sit today. It seems like it's a much different um, situation than would have been the case in the past where, you know, I can remember the days where our our work here was often, what are the four corners? Let's kind of paint the four corners, if you will, of policy. And we would start there and then the politics would figure out where the middle ground is. And I think, don't see that playing quite the same way today as would have been the case, oh, let, let's say back in the 1990s. Big changes for sure. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate all the insight. You bet. That's Dr. Scott Brown from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Hope you'll sign up for our weekly American Farmland Owner newsletter where we have in depth analysis and interviews on the latest challenges and trends. And it's free. Just sign up at AmericanFarmlandOwner.com and we hope you'll spread the word. I'm Dave Price. Let's connect soon.